Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this meeting um, of the Center uh, for Geopolitics. My name's Brendan Sims, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I'm the director of the Center. Um, this meeting is part of our growing Baltic geopolitics uh, program, uh, which is co-run by me and Charles Clark, who's sitting there in the back. He's our Baltic uh, supremer, the driving force uh, behind everything. Um, the program looks not merely at the Baltic states, uh, but also at uh, what we call the wider Baltic Sea region. So that includes obviously Finland, Sweden, uh, Denmark, uh, Poland, uh, but also Germany. Now we've had one meeting on uh, Germany and the Baltic Sea region, a lecture by uh, Michael Epkenhans um, almost exactly a year ago, which was a great success. Um, but we did not, at that meeting, particularly talk about the Baltic Germans, who are a different uh, topic. Um, and so we're very glad indeed to have uh, two distinguished uh, panelists here uh, this evening to talk about uh, the Baltic Germans past and present. And when I say present, uh, I mean, of course, uh, the legacy. Uh, to my uh, immediate left is uh, Max Egremont, uh, who is a very well-known uh, novelist, biographer and historian, fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Uh, he's the author of an excellent book on Eastern Prussia called Forgotten Land, and then very recently, uh, the book uh, The Glass Wall, Lives on the Baltic Frontier, which is actually primarily uh, about the Baltic Germans. And I've read both, and I recommend them uh, to you. Um, and then uh, to his left is Jörg Hackmann, uh, who's a professor at the University of Szczecin, uh, also uh, teaches at Greifswald uh, in the Federal Republic of Germany. Szczecin, of course, uh, Stettin, uh, as the Germans uh, used to call it, uh, is in um, uh, Poland. Uh, and he's written very widely on the history of the Baltic Sea region, uh, and in particular on the question of dual loyalties, which is absolutely uh, critical to understanding the Baltic uh, Germans. His most recent publication, in German is called Geselligkeit in Nordosteuropa, Studien zur Vereinskultur, Zivilgesellschaft und Nationalisierungsprozessen in einer polykulturellen Region, which roughly translates uh, as sociability in Northeast Europe, studies on the associational culture, civil society, and processes of nationalization or creation of nationalism, nation perhaps, building. nation building in a polycultural region, uh, 1770, uh, to 1950, which is exactly, of course, in the subject we're talking about, which is a group of people who ex uh, inhabit a kind of a liminal sort of shadow space uh, in European history between uh, the different uh, empires uh, and nations. So I'm really looking forward uh, to what uh, we're going to talk about. And I'd like to begin with a question from Max, really, mm. um, which is to ask you how how did you, you know, how does a nice man like you <laughs> get involved uh, in, the, um, in the Baltic Germans? What was it that drew you to that subject? Well, I started going to the Baltic at the, just at the beginning of the 1990s, just as the Soviet period was coming to an end. The Soviet Empire was starting to break up. And I was particularly interested in those days in Kaliningrad, which had been the German Königsberg. I wanted to see the huge changes that had taken place during the Soviet time. I knew quite a bit about the German time there. I knew it obviously the birthplace of Kant and uh, a tremendously important German city on Germany's eastern redoubt, so to speak. So the only way to get there was to go to Vilnius and to take a train from Vilnius and I did that and I spent a lot of time in Kaliningrad and I wrote a book about it in the end. But I, during one of my early visits, I had to come back to Vilnius and then go to the west, uh, I had time on my hands so I took a train up to Riga and I suddenly realized I was in the German world. It seemed to me to be an extraordinary transposition. In a, in a curious way, it had maintained its German feel much more than Kaliningrad, which had been destroyed in a huge British mm. air raid. The whole center had been destroyed. So in a way, what had been the heart of the old Königsberg had gone. 
But with Riga, this was very much not the case. And it was that that really led me in this quest for this group, the Baltic Germans, who were a sort of colonizing class, I suppose, and the story of how they had colonized this area of Eastern Europe, which was not a part of Germany. It was Polish, and then it was Swedish, and then it was Russian. Early on, it was the Teutonic Knights, of course, but that was before Germany started to exist. Germany didn't exist, as we know, until 1871 in its united form. So it was really that that triggered my interest. Well, that, that's really interesting. And I suppose <coughs> the, I mean, the image one has of the Baltic Germans is, is of, a, of a kind of a bygone group of people which don't, no longer exist in, in the form that they, were, uh, th that they existed before. And I wondered, and, and this is not intended to be a cheeky question mm. at all, but I wondered, you know, not everybody here will know that you yourself are an aristocrat yes. and a landowner. Um, and I wondered to what extent that helped you uh, in understanding the, the, the context and, and the mindset and the framework. Well, I, first of all, I had this very strong feeling that I did exist in a strange way, and they didn't exist. They had come to an end, mm. and I wanted to see what had happened and how it affected their psyche, and I spoke to a lot of their descendants who are living in Germany today. So I suppose that did trigger an interest as well, was a certain identification, although they're often seen as a rather brutal, a rather selfish, class, I think in a, there's a Dostoevsky novel where um, somebody is described as being as cruel as a Livonian landlord. <laughs> and uh, um, there's a character in the novel Smoke by Turgenev, who is a big Livonian mm. landlord, a cruel, hard man. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to try to reach behind this and to find the reality. So let's, let's track back a little bit. Um, uh, at this point. And Jörg, I'd like to, to turn to you. C can you perhaps give us a, a quick uh, introduction to who the Baltic Germans were? How did they come to be there? Um, roughly how many of them were there? Um, some of just a general background perhaps for, for myself and for the audience so we can contextualize what's going to come. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to be here and talk about uh, Baltic uh, region, uh, people living in the, uh, uh, that, uh, who were living in this uh, region uh, and their let's say, heritage uh, and uh, the relevance it has today. And if you look at the, so I've prepared a um, couple of maps and what I'm doing is first dismantle uh, the uh, term Baltic. Um, so we are not talking about the Baltic Sea region, not at all. So. Um, this, the region is, of course, much uh, larger than our focus, and we're not talking about the Germans living around the Baltic, but a much smaller group. And let's see. Okay. Um, how do I get further here? Um, okay. Um, this seems. Okay. Maybe we'll. Uh, should have checked this before. Um, <laughs> Okay, we just leave this out. Okay, um, sorry for that. Um, not so familiar with this machine. Um, oh, okay, so. Yes, we can just use this. Okay, yeah, I think now, now we have it. Ah, right, okay, this should work. As, no, we don't need this. Um, yeah. Um, Actually, so uh, we should then, of course, so the beginnings, um, uh, as we said, uh, has to do something with the uh, Middle Ages, so with the um, colonization uh, of this region by the Teutonic Knights. Actually, they had two uh, areas uh, in focus. Uh, first was Prussia, uh, where they built up a state um, uh, of the Teu um, Teutonic Order, uh, with a, uh, also then a larger immigration of uh, German peasants, and this is uh, something which did not happen in the uh, northern region. Uh, the Teutonic Order uh, was uh, uh, ruling for a couple of centuries, and the territory uh, of this are also not the three Baltic states as we know today, but only the 
northern one of the uh, three Bs, so Estonia and uh, Latvia. And the uh, issue uh, which differs is that we are then only talking actually about two groups uh, of Germans coming to this region, landowners, uh, so people supporting uh, the order in fighting, um, and then um, town burgers, merchants uh, in the Hanseatic towns uh, along the shore. So these were the two connections uh, in the Middle Ages. Um, in early modern times, then we have a sh uh, huge shift of the region um, uh, from um, uh, the rule of uh, Teutonic order then to Swedish, uh, Russian, partly uh, Polish uh, rule. And what is relevant there is that um, the, uh, and then from uh, 18, uh, 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 let's say late 18th century onwards, the whole region is then under the control of uh, uh, Russia, so uh, Tsarist Empire, and what is relevant is uh, that uh, the idea of a Baltic actually did not yet exist at this time. So even not uh, around uh, 1800, so these Germans, um, let's say, were rather defined by what were, uh, were they doing. So they were either living as uh, landowners uh, on the uh, land, they were town burghers, or then there was a third group which was relevant, so-called literati, so people with a university education, so let's say uh, being teachers, uh, Lutheran um, pastors and so on, and uh, forming an own group. And these groups rather were, let's say, socially separated, and they were regionally separated because we have uh, in the Russian period three Baltic provinces, Estonia, Livonia, and Courland, so from north to south, and actually people were rather defining themselves as uh, inhabitant of Estonia or of, of Courland, but uh, not as Baltic. And Baltic only appeared in the mid-19th century when it was already, uh, so the Germanists came under threat. So, so far these people spoke German, they sang the sa uh, same songs uh, as people in Germany, but then they really realized something is different. And the difference was, let's say, the uh, power um, or the impact from a central power of uh, Russia, meaning that uh, there were attempts to somehow make these fringes of the Tsarist Empire more Russian than before. And this uh, then actually led to a new definition uh, of being uh, Baltic, meaning that there was something in, uh, together between the various uh, social groups, and this uh, uh, togetherness then was uh, largely defined, or with the end of 19th century defined, by uh, somehow resisting to the various uh, effects of um, Russification. So maybe we just stop, stop here and then... Thank you. I think that, that's very useful background. Um, so what you've done, you've set the scene, why the Germans are there, um, and the fact that they are essentially operating in um, a complicated political environment, uh, which they don't themselves control. So uh, I'd like to turn back now to Max. Um, before we get into some of the questions that already begin to crop up uh, in, in Jörg's remarks, which are the relationship to the empires, but let's, let's stick with the question of mentalities and behavior. I mean, you made, made reference to uh, the notorious uh, brutality uh, of, the, um, of the Baltic Germans. I mean, I remember uh, a German aristocrat from Thuringia telling me that uh, the phrase that was in his mind uh, for the Baltic Germans was, morgens letten schießen mittags domestiken prügeln. So for those who don't speak German, uh, in the morning I shoot Latvians, uh, and in the afternoon I beat up my domestic servants. You know, that, that was the image. Of the, uh, of the Baltic German. Was that justified or? or, or uh, I think that's a little bit harsher. In their memoirs, it's very interesting because yeah. particularly in the later ones that, uh, that are written about the 1920s and the 1930s, after these countries became independent, after Latvia and Estonia got their independence mm -hmm. for the first time after the First World War, these Baltic Germans who decided to stay would go on trips to Germany and they found Prussia much more extreme than their homelands. Mm. 
they were shocked at the way uh, the Prussian Junkers behaved, and they considered themselves to be much more liberal-minded. Mm. And uh, I, I, it's very difficult to get the truth about this because mm. obviously they wouldn't uh, at all like to portray themselves as being brutal. But uh, one has to remember, as uh, Georg said, it was a tremendous flowering in a way of German culture. The mm. first statue of the poet Schiller after his death was put up in, mm. the, in the Baltic states. Mm. And so there was a highly cultivated group there as well called the Literati. Mm. There were some very good writers. Uh, the, uh, uh, we'll talk about those a bit later. There was a very good novelist called Edward von Keisling, another mm. one called Siegfried von Wegersack. And so there was considerable culture as well. Wagner conducted at the Riga Opera. Clara Schumann played there, went on concert tours mm. there. So they weren't totally Philistine mm. by mm. any means. Mm. I think in some of the backwoods areas, well, as in England, uh, the sort of people that I grew up alongside in the 1950s, there was a great deal of crudity. Mm. Um, around, you mm. know, the local squires that mm. I met when I was growing up in Sussex were not mm. highly cultivated people at all. Jörg, would you agree with that, that actually the, <clears throat> in terms of cultural production uh, and engagement, uh, what, we, what is, uh, uh, as it were, uh, transmitted... I must make it plain, Sorry, the yeah. squires in Sussex yeah. didn't beat their <laughs> They didn't do that. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so actually uh, there was, um, in particular in the 18th century, so after the uh, end of the Northern Wars with all this destruction, there was a new wave uh, of uh, migration. Actually, not so much uh, many noblemen, but rather to the uh, towns. And as I said, so these uh, pastors uh, and uh, teachers, and so we have uh, Johann Gottfried Herder, and actually so Herder's impact comes from the... Um, that he saw, let's say, these non-German uh, peasant people, uh, which he thought are much more, let's say, to uh, um, the idea of humanity. Uh, they uh, incorporate the idea of humanity, which uh, the Germans uh, do not uh, do because they are too brutal. So, and having looking for these peaceful uh, people being, let's say, um, symbol of new mankind. So, actually, had a, a found there, and you could then uh, mention quite a, a number of uh, other people. So actually, and they really thought, let's say, that the cultural space uh, was German. But so this German space also included, I would say, uh, uh, Finland, uh, St. Petersburg, uh, Viborg, and so on. So this, and you could travel without major problems. So this, uh, and one should also say, uh, so what did the uh, inhabitants of the region do? So what did the noblemen do? So they, um, of course, often went to Germany, so made their uh, grand tour uh, to Germany, and then further on, often studied uh, at the German universities before the University of uh, Dorpat was founded. So. Thank you. So I think you both made clear that actually this, this image of the Baltic Germans uh, and their brutality is something of a myth. And I think one of the great things about your, your recent book, Max, is that it really shows that it is a whole civilization with many different facets that needs, needs really to be engaged with much more than, than has been the case. So let's talk a little bit about the relationship of the Baltic Germans uh, in terms of uh, to uh, the, the, the empires within which they sat, because of course they didn't control their own territory. They were always, if I understand it rightly, they were always part of a wider imperial whole. Um, first Sweden, than uh, the Tsarist Empire. So how, how did they, Max, let's start with you. How did they slot in? Um, how, 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 what was their role there? Well, the system of education was very high in the, in the Baltic states. And very many Baltic Germans played a very significant part as bureaucrats and as generals in the Russian Empire, the old Russian Empire, not the Soviet Empire, mm -hmm. but the Empire of the Tsars. I think, I think a family called the Wrangel family, for instance, had very many generals and field marshals. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and that applies to the Kaiserling family as well. Alexander von Kaiserling was a very distinguished geologist mm -hmm. and, uh, and also a very distinguished Russian bureaucrat in, in Imperial Russia. But they felt their loyalty, I think, I don't know whether you would agree with this, uh, I think they felt their loyalty to the Tsars mm -hmm. rather than to Imperial Russia. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the first war broke out, there was this uh, uh, dilemma, of course, and they mostly fought for the Russians. Mm -hmm. So let, let's come back to the First World War, which is obviously a, 
a defining moment uh, in, in both of your stories. But let's stick uh, for a minute to uh, the 18th and 19th century. And, and I wonder, Jörg, could you say a little bit about uh, the way in which the Baltic Germans managed to make the leap from the Swedish Empire to the Russian Empire? Because presumably that must have produced some discordances, given the fact that the Swedes and the Russians had been at each other's throats, and the Baltic Germans, I suppose, had been uh, very much part of the wider Swedish enterprise. Is, is that right? Uh, yeah, so actually it's not only Sweden, but we should also have the uh, Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth uh, also in mind. Mm -hmm. But let's say, what was the, the interest of uh, the nobility uh, actually to keep uh, the privileges? So mm -hmm. let's say to bring the rulers to um, accept uh, the special rights that they have. And there was an, an issue with Sweden then after... Um, uh, oh, in the period of the Nordic Wars. So that... Can you just give us the dates? So um, mid-16th century, so when Ivan the Great, uh, Ivan the Terrible, started to uh, attack the region uh, until then uh, 1721, the Peace of Neustadt, when then the situation was then clear that the Baltic region, as we talk now about, so was then part of the Russian Empire. Um, so, uh, what was the issue with Sweden? So, uh, Sweden uh, was uh, very much interested in getting uh, money out of the provinces in order to uh, provide all the wars uh, they wanted to. And this uh, then um, led to a conflict that those local uh, nobility was not that much, uh, uh, let's say, uh, content with the situation in Sweden and then tried to negotiate uh, when it was clear that there was a rivalry between uh, Peter the Great uh, and then uh, uh, Charles XII. So that, uh, whether maybe the guarantees that they had um, could be then um, given or uh, guaranteed, um, or the, the rights could be guaranteed by uh, the Russian Tsar. And this was uh, then uh, the thing which actually um, led to the situation then in 1710 so that the nobility actually um, so this is the better position for them because so Peter offered them that they could live uh, uh, as before without the pressure from the Swedish king. The issue then was, of course, uh, the local population. So what the Swedish rule did was, and this is relevant for the um, emergence of the small nations, so bringing uh, literacy to the peasants. So this is something which we are Lutheran church uh, already in, um, in Swedish time uh, was... Uh, Produced, which of course then uh, uh, the Russian uh, rulers were not uh, that much interested in educating the peasants. So you've brought us to a really critical issue which has been uh, uh, touched on uh, previously in our discussion but not, not really addressed, which is that relationship between the Baltic Germans and the wider population. Because of course the Baltic Germans were only a minority. Max, could, could you perhaps uh, tell us a bit about where they sit demographically within these provinces? Who, 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 who makes up the majority and what is the relationship between the Baltic Germans and effectively the, the, this majority population? Well, I think it's true to say, you'll, you'll correct me if I'm uh, not right about this, but I think they were never more than 10 or 12 percent of the population. The, the vast, vast numbers, of course, were the Latvians and the Estonians. There was a significant Jewish population, but the Baltic Germans were a very small proportion of the whole. But in order to succeed in these countries, you had effectively to become a German, absorb German culture, absorb the German language. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was so... Uh, for, I mean, almost up to the beginning of the First World War, although it started to fade under Russification, which started in about 1860. It then started to fade, but it was a very, very powerful domination. It dominated the education, it dominated the church, it dominated the political aspect of these countries. So, Jörg, how easy was it for... Um, Latvians and Estonians to become, as it were, Baltic Germans by assimilation. What, was, it, was that possible? Could, could one uh, uh, sort of enter into that class simply through education and linguistic aptitude? Uh, yes, of course. And, uh, but we should also uh, have in mind that the category German actually uh, 
did not tell much until late 19th century. Mm -hmm. Let's say these noblemen, of course, they were speaking German, but mm -hmm. uh, th think of noblemen in, in Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's say 18th century, they were speaking French. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. in Poland, mm -hmm. uh, so the, even the uh, Lithuanian nobility was uh, speaking Polish. So this meaning uh, differentiation by language um, was nothing um, totally mm -hmm. um, um, exceptional. Um, this, this we uh, should have in mind. Um, and the question uh, is how education then worked. Uh, so, uh, and of course, uh, the idea then was, uh, so if you are educated and go to gymnasium or university, and then of course, so the small languages mm -hmm. did not play any role. So meaning that uh, if you uh, want to achieve education somehow, you had to adopt to the language. But we also have the other way around. So this, uh, there is this, uh, a famous model by Miroslav Roch looking at the nation building or how the small nation emerged as modern nations. And the, his first uh, stage is um, the learned interest in mm. these uh, small uh, nations. And actually what we have is, so the first dictionaries, the newspapers and so on were uh, produced by um, originally <laughs> German speaking literati mm -hmm. um, teachers, uh, parish priests who also knew the language of uh, the peasants or mm -hmm. of the um, community. And uh, so there, actually there was an exchange. And let's say only late 19th century, this then it goes apart. So that means that if you're really um, an educated Estonian, then you should mm -hmm. uh, not have uh, the German background. Or let's say if you switch from an Estonian background to a German culture, mm -hmm. then you are somehow regarded as a traitor and so mm -hmm. on. So Max, you, you said something earlier on, which I think uh, brings us to uh, a really problematic period for the Baltic Germans, which is that you said that their loyalty uh, in each case was very much to the either the monarchy in the Swedish case or the Tsar in the Russian case, but not to the Russian nation. And it's already been mentioned that there are, there's a process of Russification. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the um, perspectives and, and the room for maneuver for the Baltic Germans begin to, to um, uh, you know, it begin, or begins to sort of contract somewhat in, in the late 19th century? if that is correct. Well, I think the key, the key, one of the key moments is the unification of Germany in 1870, 1871. And uh, that was the time that the Russians began to have a sense that there was this huge new power in Europe. They had this German speaking, uh, this area of their empire controlled by this German speaking minority. Mm -hmm. And they began to have a certain anxiety uh, about it. Al although one has to remember that the Tsars, of course, many of the Tsars were married to Germans. Mm -hmm. Alexander mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. was married to a German, so was Nicholas I. Catherine the Great, the mm -hmm. great Empress of Russia, was mm -hmm. the, came from Germany. And so there was this extraordinary exchange of culture and of language, but also the, there were the political tensions as well, and I think they did begin to grow as the 19th century went on, particularly after the unification. For instance, Bismarck, uh, um, uh, very soon after the unification, he made a treaty with Russia. He made it clear he had no, um, no, no ambitions in the East at all, or, or, or he said he didn't. But uh, this, he, he'd also been the German ambassador, of course, in Russia earlier. And he had then, he'd made some rather boastful remarks about the way that the German-speaking people in the Baltic provinces, mm -hmm. about the huge contribution that they'd made to Imperial mm -hmm. Russia. Mm -hmm. So nationalism is clearly a disaster for the Baltic Germans because they've been put by the late 19th century under pressure from the Russian state and, and pan-Slavism in Russia. Is it also the case, Jörg, that there's nationalism beginning to bubble up uh, in Latvia and Estonia? And, and when, yes. does that, when does that begin? Well, that, no. well please, <laughs> go. No, please, please. Uh, uh, let's um, 
uh, put the, let's say, let, and let me and Estonia for a moment aside. So look at the Germans. So when German nationalism in the region became uh, role, and this is around 1900. So then we got, there was a group of literati which uh, found a club called Kilimanjaro. Uh, why? Because it was the highest mountain oh. in the German Empire. So it's <laughs> 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 so it was. Uh, um, so you see the or orientation. At least uh, uh, there was some uh, dual focus, uh, de definitely. And then the, is uh, the revolution of 1905. And the re revolution of 1905, with the, all these, um, actually, were these uh, brutal conflicts that then emerged, probably also the idea of shooting the Latvians. So uh, when lots of uh, manor houses were burned down, which brings uh, then the German to think, OK, so we also have to nationalize ourselves, as do the Latvians and as do the Estonians. So let's, this means after uh, 1905, uh, we have definitely also a German national movement uh, in, in the Baltic provinces uh, of, uh, of Russia. So in other words, the Baltic Germans are being squeezed from, from two ends, from below, as it were, uh, and from above. Um, so clearly, the First World War has got to be a massive rupture yeah. for them. Max, can, can you take us through what kind of you know, discordances uh, and, and traumas the First World War produced for the Baltic Germans? Well, at the very beginning of the war, uh, in the campaign in East Prussia, the Germans, led by Hindenburg, found themselves up against General Rennenkampf, who was a general in the Imperial Russian Army, but of German-speaking mm -hmm. origin. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was this complication. Very many, I mean, it comes in the novels of Siegfried von Wegesack, his hero at the beginning of the war in 1914 has to decide. He's in Germany, studying in Germany, but he decides, I must fight for the Tsar. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's obviously a clash of loyalties. Yes. Um, and then, in 1917, if yes. there's another blow. Um, Jörg, would you like to tell us a little bit about how, what 1917 does uh, to the Baltic German community? Yeah, so um, actually 1917 or then 1918, so uh, with the um, collapse uh, of, the German, uh, of the power of the German Reich so in the region. So this definitely uh, changes the situation. So far there was the idea by the German Reich to somehow include this region uh, under German control as a kingdom dependent uh, on Germany or some kind of a duchy. Uh, but then it, is, uh, it becomes clear uh, that the small nations are, have, have a say. Um, and actually what happened uh, in Estonia is uh, quite telling. So the Declaration of Independence of Estonia was made on uh, February 24th, uh, 1918, actually in, in the night when the Russians, Bolshevik, uh, retreated and the Germans were not yet, not yet there. And what they did in this declaration, so the Estonians, was uh, that they addressed all nations uh, of Estonia, so of Estonian territory, and then mentioned the Germans, uh, Swedes, uh, Jews, and uh, Russians. So, uh, and this then pointed a way how to uh, arrange uh, uh, themselves as national minority. This was then the term coming up, of course, not appreciated by the Germans. But uh, this was a situation uh, they found themselves in. And similar uh, in, um, was the situation in Latvia. So in 1918, we have the end of the war. Mm. Um, uh, Europe is in, is in uproar um, in, in many places, certainly Central uh, and Eastern Europe. Um, and reading your book, it suddenly, I mean, it becomes very complicated yes. at this point. And I don't think we can go into every no. single detail and curlicue. No, it's but, but in fact, we have an expert here on the uh, Vilnius problem in, in our Baltic Research Fellow, Donatus oh. Kupchuna. So we have, we have some mm. uh, additional Baltic expertise here. Um, but can you just give us a little bit of a taste of, of the kind of dynamics that are in play between 1918 uh, and the beginning of the 1920s, when things begin to settle down. There's a lot going on in the Baltic states, and the yes. Baltic Germans are, are quite centrally involved, aren't yes. they? Yes. Well, from the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk until the end of the war, these countries became a part of the German Empire. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and uh, there was uh, long discussions about what form they might take, whether they might be a semi-independent dukedom. I think the Duke of Mecklenburg was considered as a possible uh, person who might be put in as a ruler. And then, uh, of course, the war came to an end in November 1918, leaving a large German army in the east and also leaving a threat from the Bolsheviks in the east as well. And there was this extraordinary campaign in the East where troops came from Germany, the Freikorps, which was a, the equivalent of what we, uh, we uh, what were called the Black and Tans in Ireland. There were these volunteers who had fought in the First War who went East with the promise of land quite often. And uh, the, the German force under General Rudiger von der Goltz was very successful and pushed the Bolsheviks back. But there were these other forces as well. There was the, the Baltic Landeswehr, who were, were, were composed largely of the German-speaking people who, who, who were living there. There was the Estonian army and the Latvian army. And there was the British Navy as well, which was involved. I think General von der Gault really believed that he might be able to march on St. Petersburg and turn uh, what had been a defeat into the First War into a victory from the East, so to speak. But that didn't come about, and in the end the Germans were forced to retreat and to leave, and these countries became independent for the first time with the support of the Allies, the support of the British and the French and the Americans. So after the dust has settled, the position is, as you say, the three Baltic states are now independent. Uh, you've got Bolshevik Russia, which has survived. Uh, the Baltic Germans have not succeeded in the endeavor you mentioned. So, Jörg, what is the perspective now in the 1920s and through the 1930s for the Baltic Germans? Presumably their position uh, has, has greatly changed and they must be under some kind of challenge. So the major issue was uh, land reform. So because we had the situation that still more than 50% of the land that could be uh, uh, worked upon was uh, in the hand of the uh, largely uh, Baltic German nobility. So this was an issue in Estonia and Latvia and it was clear that without a land reform these new states would not work. Which actually some of the Baltic German politicians also understood that this uh, must be done, otherwise uh, it would not work. So this, but nevertheless, uh, were of course many people who emigrated, uh, who lost uh, then their possessions, meaning even the way of uh, living was no longer possible, so they had to sell their manor house and so on. And with the whole uh, crisis, so a collapse also with the market uh, towards uh, so uh, Russia, so also many uh, of the uh, merchants. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, towns also really uh, can run into problems. So it means we have an uh, emigration from the region uh, by, I would say, uh, largely economic reasons. And then we have a political uh, question. So whether to uh, somehow um, adapt to the new situation or to uh, fully oppose. Uh, both we see, but the, let's say, uh, dominating case then in Estonia was uh, to implement um, cultural autonomy, so non-territorial autonomy, because the, the Germans were sp spread all over the country, so uh, not in, only in one place, so where they could have some regional autonomy, so non-territorial autonomy was then the idea, which was uh, developed in cooperation with the uh, so uh, of Estonian and German politicians. Um, Werner Hasselblatt is the most important person there. Uh, we have it similar in um, Latvia, uh, where uh, Paul Schiemann um, was then uh, the uh, advocate of the German minorities, but actually not so much uh, national German, but uh, nationalist German, but rather the other way around, looking for some kind of an a national state as he told it so well, there would be a place for the Germans uh, as a, a minority in that way. So the Baltic Germans are very much uh, at this point uh, under pressure, um, economically, politically. Now, obviously in Germany, after 1933, we have a completely different situation. We have the uh, uh, accession to power of Adolf Hitler. He is a man, as is well known, who had strong views on the position of the Germans in the East. Max. How, how do the Baltic Germans 
fit into Hitler's conception, uh, but also how, uh, uh, do, uh, how did he fit into their conceptions? What, what's the relationship between National Socialism uh, and the Baltic Germans? Well, I think it's fair to say that some Baltic Germans were excited by the rise of Hitler and they hoped perhaps to regain power because Hitler, they knew, had this idea of expansion in the East. But there were others, for instance, Paul Schiemann was horrified by the Nazis. And so there was a division in the community. Uh, and uh, people who went to Germany, Baltic Germans who or German-speaking people from the Baltics who went to Germany uh, were often impressed by a certain obvious ending of, uh, of a rather chaotic uh, life that as it existed during the, the 20s and 30s, but others, of course, were very shocked. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they were divided. And, and then, of course, came uh, the terrible pact between the Soviets and Hitler, uh, which uh, carved up Eastern Europe and uh, the Baltics were given to Stalin. And that was when the real exodus of mm. Baltic Germans began and they went to the Wattgau, an area, of what used to be an mm. area of Poland, mm. uh, and they were settled, resettled there. It had been conquered by Germany. They were resettled there in a state supposedly similar to the one that they had left. For mm -hmm. instance, if they were landowners, they were given a similar amount of land. If they were distillers, they were given a mm -hmm. distillery. And uh, this was supposed to be their new life. But of course, all that ended in mm -hmm. 1944, 45, when the Red Army came in mm -hmm. and they had to flee west. So sh shall we, uh, before we reach that point, which is obviously uh, the critical moment, um, Let's track back a bit. So, so Max has described the process of, of what was known at the time as Heimensreich, uh, returning into back to the German Empire, a sort of the great ingathering of German people. I think you've got it up here on the slide. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, Jörg, how do, how many, roughly speaking, um, how many Baltic Germans are part of this process? I mean, should, should we see that really as, as the end point of the Baltic German community? Or, and how do they fit in, those that do move, how do they fit in in Germany itself? Yeah, so actually, um, still one uh, step back. So this uh, Folkish movement uh, definitely so was a, a generational issue. So the younger um, of the minorities, so they were absolutely pro-Hitler. Uh, the elders saw the problem, what uh, happens if everyone is talking about uh, German folk and so on, uh, what does this mean? Um, but uh, what then, uh, the crucial point, uh, I fully agree, so the Molotov uh, Ribbentrop Pact, which uh, then actually led to the decision that um, the only way for the Baltic Germans is uh, the um, uh, dictated option, so they actually they have no option, they have to leave bec because you could imagine how life then uh, under Stalin's uh, Soviet Union would like uh, look like for these uh, rather uh, elitist uh, group, uh, group. So this was quite clear and actually it was so there's one um, Baltic German from Latvia who then claimed that he gave Himmler the hint in October uh, 39 that the only way is to bring the Baltic Germans out and actually almost all of them left. So there were some stages, so not all in the first, uh, so let's say uh, end of 39, early 40, but then there was so-called Nachumsiedlung. But nevertheless, at the end, almost everyone except Paul Schiemann uh, uh, left and because they had no other options. So there's one case, um, actually um, German, Danish, um, Estonian historian, uh, who then also decided, oh, so uh, actually he would, would have liked to say, I suppose, but he, so, no, but he said it's quite clear. So under these circumstances that will come, there will be you no know, chance. And mm -hmm. also the Estonian politicians understood uh, what was happening when the Germans left, that they then will be prey to um, uh, Stalin. Um, the problem then uh, emerged, and this is what you were talking uh, uh, about. So they were not integrated into Altreich, so real Germany, but to the new, uh, newly exact, uh, annexed uh, territories from Poland, which then uh, man, uh, meant that they, of course, wanted to have similar possessions, uh, apartments, uh, uh, lands, so that then Polish uh, 
uh, citizens, uh, uh, landowners, mm -hmm. had to be pushed away from these, uh, from Wartegau, from mm -hmm. uh, Danzig Westpreußen, also from Stettin, so uh, in order to make place for these uh, Baltic Germans coming in. So it was mm -hmm. absolutely a toxic situation for, for everyone. And you could even go one step further. There's a German uh, historian, uh, Götz Ali, who argues that actually the idea of uh, killing the Jews uh, comes, uh, let's say, at the end of this uh, issue of resettlement, that you need space for those uh, uh, coming Heimens Reich and so on. And uh, at the end, then the Jews are those who could be then uh, removed uh, and killed. So actually, the, uh, in a sense, the end of the historic Baltic German community is in 1939-1940 with the return to the Reich, and so that the Soviet occupation of the Baltic states in 44, 45 um, actually finds the Germans basically gone. But Max, I suppose uh, these Baltic Germans, who, as, as Jörg is saying, had been uh, um, brought back in inverted commas uh, uh, to the Vaterland and other areas, presumably they had to move again uh, when the Poles and they the. Did. Yeah. Can you just tell us, uh, as a final yes. sort of coda, a little bit about that? It was yeah. quite a, a, extraordinary. Uh, the move from the Baltic states to the Vatgau was a, a huge operation, and these cruise ships were sent uh, to Riga and to various other ports, and the Baltic Germans were put onto them. And as the ships sailed out, the dance bands would strike up, and uh, the, the idea that they were going to a new paradise was put across to them, and then they arrived, and of course they found that it was not particularly, uh, particularly a paradise, although they were given more or less the equivalent of what they had left behind, but uh, there were, it was at the expense of the Poles, so it, it, it was an extremely unpleasant operation. They very quickly became aware of that, but it, it, that was the end, effectively, of their life. And they then went west again when the Red Army came in. And uh, there, there, are, uh, there are communities now in, in, in uh, Germany who uh, they have a newsletter, they, they, uh, they, they have a schloss which they, uh, they meet and they, um, they have Baltic functions, and they they generally tend to marry each other too. So, so it very much there is a sense, I think, that the community survives, although in exile, obviously, and they go back on holiday, and they they make very generous contributions to the restoration of houses or of German-speaking people's monuments mm -hmm. in the Baltic states. For instance, the Palace of Rundale. Uh, has been very generously supported by Baltic German mm. organizations, particularly the restoration of, of the magnificent coffins of the Dukes of Courland, which is the most extraordinary site. So uh, the connection mm. survives. Mm. Yes, so thank you. So we're going to move to questions in about two minutes, but I just mm. wanted finally to address exactly the issue that you've already touched on, which is the question of the role of the Baltic Germans. Uh, in the Federal Republic today, but also in the Baltic states. Do you have anything to add to what Max has just yeah. said? Uh, very, uh, very briefly. So um, actually, then uh, the, those who survived uh, these uh, being uh, twice uh, expelled uh, then uh, actually uh, formed new communities um, in uh, Western Germany, as did all the other expellees, but with uh, one um, difference. So the one, uh, I think the Ritterschaften, so rather uh, separated themselves and were not interested in being together with all the other Landsmannschaften. Mm -hmm. And even among those um, expertly organizations, so the Baltic were always uh, the most open towards the region. So mm -hmm. totally different from uh, Silesian uh, Landsmannschaft, Sudeten, German, and so on. So this means uh, there was obviously another approach towards uh, the region they were coming from with the effect as, as uh, Max already told. So if you were both to look back mm. on the story we've just um, discussed, what in your view is the legacy of the Baltic Germans? Well, uh, during the Soviet times, uh, the Baltic states w was the home of what was the Soviet high-tech industry. And the education um, system there uh, 
had enormously benefited from, particularly from the involvement of the Lutheran Church mm. uh, over the years. And uh, there was a very different atmosphere. People who traveled through the Soviet Union said that in what is now Estonia and in Latvia, <coughs> there was a very different atmosphere to the mm. rest mm. of the Soviet of, of the Soviet Empire. And uh, so uh, there is a legacy. And, and uh, certainly going back to Peter the Great, Peter, part of the reason Peter the Great, I think, was uh, he restored the, uh, um, uh, the power of the, and, the, and the privileges of the Baltic Germans because he had this idea that Russia must open up to the West, that it must have windows to Western Europe. Mm. And I, there is, I think that feeling it, it, it has mm -hmm. survived over the years. Hence, all the Baltic, the German-speaking people from the Baltic states, their involvement in the Imperial Russian Army. And, and uh, it, it's a continuing mm -hmm. process, I think. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of Baltic Germans in the Federal Diplomatic Service. Yes, there are. Jörg, you have the last word. <laughs> yeah, so uh, what remains? I think it's something like, um, Civility, uh, civic uh, spirit. So, me, uh, so I think you see it in the mentality. So I would say this. So of course you also see it in the let's say built uh, heritage, so in the manor houses and the um, architecture. But it's also in the uh, mentality of the uh, Estonian and uh, Latvian nations. And this is probably the let's say um, indirect uh, impact, but definitely the most important one. All right, thank you very much. So we now have um, plenty of time, about half an hour plus for, for discussion and questions uh, before we move to our uh, reception and, and further conversation, um, if you'd like. Um, and uh, uh, please, uh, when you ask a question, if you wouldn't mind, uh, in some cases I know who you are, but if you wouldn't mind just saying who you are, uh, uh, what your affiliation is, uh, if you have one. Go ahead. Uh, yes, you go wrong there, basically. I was fascinated by the distinction. We talked a lot about land ownership in this, this evening, but I was fascinated by the distinction between land ownership and um, what I as the economy associate most, which is the Hansa and the commercial world. I was wondering if you found any evidence of the relationship between those two different economic units within the world of German community. How do they talk to each other? How did a Berlin reader interacts with the German manner, for example. What was the relation between them and how did it change over time? Thank you. Well, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, what one might describe as the merchant class dominated the cities. They dominated Riga and Tallinn, <coughs> and the, the, um, the rural areas were dominated by the, the, the landowners, of course. I think, if you'll forgive me, saying, I think it was a rather snobbish society, so there wasn't a tremendous amount of doing and throwing between the, the two sectors. Um, uh, would you say they mixed? What, what, what do you think, Jörg? Uh, I think from time to time. I think there were economic uh, interests, of course. Oh. Um, and if you look uh, at sociability, of course, so there were burger clubs and there were... Uh, nobility clubs, but uh, from time to time, so at least of uh, this uh, living in the, uh, so the activity of the uh, noble club was a little bit too boring mm. for the nobility, so they it's also went to the, <laughs> to the uh, burger clubs mm. because there was uh, more action, more festivities. So definitely there was an exchange, but I think still you ha should have in mind so that social distinction uh, was, uh, let's say, until mid 19th century what mattered. Not uh, whether they spoke the language. So, so actually, those people could communicate almost uh, every language. So they c could communicate so with the uh, Estonian, Latvian peasants, or they could um, yeah. communicate with the Russian um, authorities and so on. And probably they also sp uh, spoke uh, Swedish or French uh, as well. So, Well, I think this is a very interesting point that you've just made. People think that they were a provincial society, but every one of them spoke two or three languages. They spoke Russian, they spoke German. They'd been taught Estonian or Latvian when they were younger. They'd met Estonians and Latvians. So in that way, it was not provincial. Thank you. Um, my name is Charles Clark. I'm associated with the program. Um, I'm going to take a bit further this question about language and education. Um, I was interested because my wife's grandfather uh, was originally called Martha, and then in 1919, 
Marimar, the big Baltic German, from the Baltic German family. He was a teacher, and he then made quite a lot of money by writing maths textbooks for school children in Estonia. In Estonian, because of course now the teaching language was Estonian rather than any other language in the school. And that's where he made his money and then went into local politics later in the town of Billiandi. But I was just interested in your discussion, both of you, about place of education. Where did Estonia fit in this? What was the impact of 1990 and independence in that period? And what languages were actually being taught? What was the level of schooling uh, throughout society at all? Uh, how did that work? And I'm just being interested in the commentary. We both had on that dimension of the discussion on the Baltic German relationship to the education of the mass of the population. Okay, yeah, um, so we should have in mind that until, uh, so in the period, let's say from the late 1880s to uh, 1905, 1906, so the language of the schooling system was Russian. So no matter whether there were German uh, students or Estonian or Latvian, so all of them had to go through Russian schools. And obviously, so there were then attempts to uh, do private schools after the revolution of 1905, but then with the new states it was clear then that state language was then the um, either Estonian or Latvian, and meaning that, of course, then uh, the, also the materials had to uh, be produced. Um, of course, there were also uh, German schools, uh, and I think Russian uh, uh, at uh, some parts as well, at least uh, in the region where there was a larger Russian population. Um, but still, so if, let's say, uh, if I look at um, uh, memories from Germans from this period, this was quite clear. If they uh, uh, went to, to school uh, in, let's say, Tallinn uh, in the 1920s, it was clear that they did it in Estonian, uh, so, and they were able to do it. So it's, we sh is, uh, still should have in mind so that the uh, language skills definitely were uh, much broader than we usually would expect it uh, today. But it was qu quite clear that uh, with the uh, new situation, so that, uh, that the uh, language of the uh, small nations then uh, needed to, uh, to be uh, promoted. And there was actually, I think, no real discussion about this, uh, that this is something wrong. But was it true that in the 1920s and 30s, the second language taught in most Estonian in Latvian schools was still German, wasn't it? I would assume, yeah. Mm. yeah and it was uh, the major language in the Baltic Sea region, yeah. it didn't definitely, yeah. so. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, my name is David Kent, I'm also one of the members of the program. Thank you for a fascinating discussion. Two questions, if I may, both from the people. Um, you mentioned land ownership. So, after the end of the 20th century, were there any legacy land claims? If so, how were they dealt with? And then, second, completely different. If the population, the Baltic population, was a 10%, then standing today from a 90% non German population, what is the view of, of, that, of that era, of that legacy, and, and that uh, the question? <laughs> yeah, uh, land ownership. So, um, of course, uh, there were protests against uh, the reform, uh, land reforms, and uh, at least in Estonia, it, uh, so the uh, real, um, I think it was 50 hectares, which, Ooh, which were uh, le uh, left to the uh, former owner. So this was uh, then changed afterwards, so that they could at least have a little bit more. But nevertheless, so it totally changed the situation, and also it changed uh, then the, uh, the, the question is what to do with the manor houses. So if you don't have, let's say, uh, income from uh, agrarian production, of course, you then also have difficulties um, uh, keeping uh, the houses, so meaning that many of these houses then also already in this period uh, were either sold or turned into uh, schools uh, so uh, that they uh, found an, another use. Um, what was your second question? Can I just say there was okay. a great, there, there was a great uh, uh, um, question after the Soviet Empire came to an end and the uh, new Estonia and the new Latvia came into being. There were huge numbers of these manor houses all over the country. And they, they, they really didn't quite know what to do with them. 
And so I think there was a certain amount of touting around these Baltic German families in Germany saying, would you like your manor house back? <laughs> and some of these... Some of these manor houses are very, very big, and some of them, to be perfectly frank, are quite ugly. And I don't think these people responded with tremendous amount of enthusiasm. A few people did uh, get their, get their, get their manor And of course, keeping up a manor house is very, very expensive. And so there were some Baltic Germans who, who had been very successful businessmen in Germany who did take up the offer. Um, uh, and perhaps come for holidays to a house on the sea or somewhere and have a, enjoy themselves there. But if you go there now, you do see that a lot of them have been turned into golf clubs. Some of them have been turned into hotels, but some of them are crumbling. Not, uh, that, um, not that that's a terribly serious problem. Actually, uh, I think we should also differentiate. So on the one hand, um, the... Uh, both uh, states, so Estonia and Latvia after 19, uh, uh, 1991, were very much interested in restoring uh, the, uh, let's say, statehood citizenship before 1940. So meaning, let's say, giving, even re, uh, restoring ownership uh, was an argument, but um, as far as I know, rather connected to urban uh, possessions. So let's say, if, if your family or your, let's say, grandfather had a house in Riga, then you could uh, uh, get it back. Uh, but, of course, with uh, obligations that you uh, should uh, uh, care about and, and so on. But actually, um, I do not know cases of, the, uh, uh, of restored uh, manor houses. So, so actually, uh, I, uh, I came across a few. Uh, of, course, of course, a Riga house would be a lovely thing to get back because it would be valuable and you could turn <laughs> it into apartments. But a great crumbling Victorian house in the middle of the Estonian plain, we would not really want to spend a lot of time in, I would have thought. Would that be unfair to say that? So, uh, of course, uh, there are many changes. So, uh, uh, many of these manor houses were privatized, and, and I knew, uh, know at least one case where an um, Estonian uh, uh, citizen uh, then oh. bought such a manor house, but uh, I think with huge problems yes. uh, in keeping it. So, yes. uh, I think the basic problem there is the date. Uh, uh, of restitution. So if you're going back to 1939, you've already lost most of your land in the land reform. So you prob you'd, you'd probably, to make it viable, you'd have to go back before the First World War. So I'll come to the next question in a minute, but David, you had a second part to your question, didn't you? Which was the view of this non-German descendant population in Estonia and Latvia today of, of that place? Yeah, maybe it's difficult to um, come to one opinion. So, of course, you, you could say that uh, are people who then had, let's say, this uh, negative uh, Soviet type, uh, stereotype of the German fascists uh, and uh, bourgeois uh, yeah. and uh, feudal classes, and it's good that they are gone. But I would say it's rather than the, uh, uh, what came uh, up in it from the 1980s, is rather uh, talking about the Baltic Germans also as part of an anti-Soviet discourse. So uh, claiming this uh, German-Baltic uh, legacy as part of their own history then is uh, at the same time a stance against uh, Soviet domination of the region. But you certainly feel when you read the memoirs, uh, earlier memoirs, that the looking back to the Baltic Germans probably uh, uh, and, until the Soviets arrived, that was thought to be a bad time, then the Soviets arrived and now there's a, not exactly nostalgia but there's interest isn't there in Baltic German life and e even some people quite like to be claimed to be descended from Baltic Germans. Baltic Germans uh, did have a great number of children in ways that they shouldn't <coughs> have done and so there are people around who can claim to be descended from them. Uh, Paul Zuckerman, I'm interested in this uh, deeply, and my question is perhaps unfair to us. Do you think that the Putin parties did it influence the Putin view uh, of, of politics uh, and this extraordinary Yeah. You're going to stay in the death. 
Well, of course, there are, the, there are these large Russian minorities in, living in these countries because when they became a part of the Soviet Union, Stalin moved a whole lot of Russians in there to counteract the Estonians and the Latvians. And they are now looked upon with a certain amount of concern by the Estonians and Latvians because they're worried that they might be a fifth column. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think that they perhaps are likely to be because I think life is so much better for them in Latvia and Estonia than it would be in Putin's Russia. When you go to Narva, which is an Estonian frontier town, right on the frontier with Russia, you look across the river to the great castle of Ivangorod, the Russian castle on the other side, and you've only got to go across and within a few miles you realize you're in a country that has a much lower standard of living. And the Russians in Estonia and Latvia, they're part of the Schengen Agreement, they can travel throughout Europe. But I think they're worried now because they feel the Estonians and the Latvians are worried about them and suspicious mm. of them. So th there is anxiety mm. there still. But I, I don't think the Russians are a likely fifth column. I may be wrong about that, but I don't think they're, unless they're treated very badly by the Estonians. And they, were a, they were a colonial class, the Russians. They were there and they, they like to think of themselves as superior to the Latvians and the Estonians. And when these countries became independent, in order to become a citizen of Latvia or Estonia, you had to take a language exam. And a lot of these Russians hadn't even troubled to learn the language. And there are a lot of Russians there still, older ones, who can't speak Latvian, who can't speak Estonian. Thank you. Do you want yeah, to add to um, that? I think so. History doesn't play a role for Putin or if then the other way around. So when he was uh, thinking about remaking so uh, Peter's uh, lost battle at Narva, so that the second time or the third time, then it will be really successful. This is, I think, the way Putin uh, thinks of the Baltic region. Uh, but uh, so uh, talking about uh, the Russian uh, minority, I would uh, fully agree. And the problem now is that a certain uh, model of living has come to an end. So far, they could very uh, well live with these gray passports. So there was actually no need to apply for Estonian or Latvian mm -hmm. citizenship because they could freely travel within the Schengen space and they could freely travel to, to Russia without any problems. And this has now come to an end. And I assume that uh, activating this population as some uh, uh, group that should be uh, uh, rescued by Putin uh, definitely does not work out. Maybe there are some who still think, but this is a generation issue, so the younger ones are ready for a longer time, so they see the future uh, in, in Europe and not in Russia, which also then uh, uh, implies so applying for citizenship, doing the language tests, and so on. And of course, the younger ones go to Estonian and Latvian schools and learn the language mm. when they're very young, so they mm. integrate perfectly well. So even even in Nava, this changes now. Mm. So yes, yes, yes. so so far, the problem was rather that uh, uh, Narva was seen from, let's say, es ethnic Estonians as something like a, a colony or something the, uh, where they would not really want to go and not work as a policeman or teacher. Mm. And now the, uh, this changes so that they see there's a need to integrate these largely Russian-speaking uh, groups yes. into the uh, Estonian uh, yes. um, nation in political terms. <laughs> Just a qualification, as part of the European project in the Baltic States uh, involving teacher training and then re education. And the exact point you made about the Russian teachers, however, is supported largely by the Russian Federation, who almost automatically encouraged to teach English instead of Russian in their high school and in their teacher training classes. The very difficult was, is it Master Stoneman? and they were distraught when we say post 50 year old generation prison who had been highly influential, but were now in a sense marginalized and discriminated 
that needed to be recycled to the education system. And the latest slide there is like several just did that teaching work there. And God is what is uh, the same as the But the Russian minorities, as I said, are still very active and are still very identifiable, especially if they are pro Estonian and the Philippines, used for networking, commercial, military, mm -hmm. and other European communication systems, for example, not least of which is what the general intelligence said about artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. a global outreach to the East, not just to the Baltic and European Union complex. So I think in the long run, the Russian, the younger generation, would be very influential. Can I ask a question about uh, something that we didn't really get to, but you touched on, which was cultural production? Mm. Um, and you know, authors like Kaiserlink and and others. Is there anything sort of um, was there anything uh, unique or particular about Baltic German literature and culture that was? I mean, it's obviously different from. Uh, from Latvian and, and uh, Estonian culture, obviously different from Russia, but how did it differ, say, from culture in the Reich, in Germany itself? Well, I think it was really where Russia and Germany did meet, where they met, the two cultures did meet. And, for instance, Kaiserling is often compared to Fontana, um, Siegfried von Wegesack, who was a distinguished Baltic German novelist, translated Chekhov, he translated Nabokov, he translated Turgenev. So there is a flavor of, of the two, um, I think, and that is perhaps what makes it quite unique. Mm. Uh, there weren't very many great authors, uh, but uh, there was a literature, mm. and um, it does have a distinctive quality, uh, not quite German and not quite Russian. Mm. Do you agree with that? Yeah, um, fully. Yeah. So and actually one might um, go one step further, and you also describe it in your book. So uh, let's say that these German, Baltic German cultural topics also then uh, influence uh, Estonian literature, if you think of the novels by Jan Cross. So exactly. we really, so it's always uh, there. It's not, not always in the, in the foreground, but uh, it's still it uh, influences, and it definitely then makes it also visible as, let's say, regionally uh, visible. So it's not just European literature about something with, with a special focus on these northeastern parts. And somebody like Kaiserling, you get the feeling there's something slightly, slightly haunted about it. Yeah. And almost as if you know, they can see what's coming down the road. But it, is that a, a fanciful view? Or? I, I think it's very, what one might describe as fin de siècle. It's mm. slightly decadent. Uh, uh, the land owners and the, uh, the class that he writes about, he hardly writes about Latvians and Estonians mm -hmm. at all, always seem to be slightly fatigued. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a sense of decline, a sense of deep pessimism, uh, perhaps under the influence of Nietzsche uh, a, a bit. But there's an elegance to those books. They're very like Turgenev, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Charles. Well, the question I'd be following up, my boy, uh, there was a question I'd been thinking of answering asking earlier in your very interesting discussion, which is the response of the Baltic Germans to 1918 and the final defeat of Germany in 1918. You describe that, particularly you mentioned two things, land reform and migration, the two things that you mentioned after that. But I also was interested, you also mentioned this, the relationship between the rest of Germany and, uh, some years later, the growth of national socialism in Germany and support for him. Could you just talk a bit more about the Baltic German response to the German defeat in 1918 uh, and how they behaved and what they did? As I say, you mentioned migration and you also mentioned that before. But also, to what extent their response influenced the growth of national socialism in Germany as a whole? <coughs> Yeah, uh, I think I, I mentioned it uh, briefly. So I, I think we, we should uh, differentiate between, let's say, the uh, 20s and then the uh, 1930s. Um, so actually, so uh, with the rise of uh, uh, national socialism, so the, these ideas definitely spread in all these uh, German minorities abroad. And this, of course, was also the idea that the German folk is larger than the uh, the territory of Germany after 1918. So um, 
so they found uh, themselves, so the younger ones, uh, very much uh, so that uh, addressed by uh, uh, these uh, uh, Nazi uh, politics. But actually, there's uh, only, I would say, one case where it really uh, influenced politics, and this is the case of the Sudeten Germans, where you have then. Um, uh, so the uh, uh, Henlein uh, and his movement clearly uh, uh, steered from Berlin, but uh, you don't uh, have this uh, at least in the, in the Baltic region. So you have these uh, national socialist movements, uh, not really uh, influential uh, in Estonia, quite influential in Latvia with Erhard Kröger, whom I already mentioned, who then uh, supposed to uh, su uh, uh, um, suggested to Hitler that uh, to, to Himmler that the Baltic Germans should be uh, resettled. Um, but uh, I think that it was, if you look at the political situation, so it was definitely. Um, a split. So there were these um, politicians, Baltic German politicians, in the 1920s who thought that uh, what they achieved is uh, uh, autonomy. So that th this is a model that works for the Germans in Eastern Europe, and this should then continue. And after 1933, then this collapses and is uh, to uh, totally turned around. Uh, yeah. Perhaps it's also worth saying that Hitler himself despised the Baltic Germans. He thought that they were decadent descendants of the Teutonic Knights, and he made it perfectly clear when uh, the Germans invaded Russia in 1941 and they conquered the Baltic states that the Baltic Germans were not going to re be returned to their former position of power. They had got too close to the Estonians and the Latvians, and they would not be ruthless enough in their rule. So they were, they were sidelined by him. There were certain individuals who came from the Baltic, uh, the Baltic states, um, I think Alfred Rosenberg. Did you have, come? of course, uh, yes, uh, yes. Rosenberg's uh, yes, um, yes. Ostministerium, but actually, but Rosenberg uh, was not really influential. So. No, no, it wasn't, exactly. No. Yes, please. Uh, hello, thank you for the discussion. It's very insightful. My name is Maria, and I am an MBA student at Cambridge Business School and, and Russia. I was born in Kaliningrad, and observation that many families who moved to this territory uh, next after the Second World War moved to all the territory of Europe till uh, 2010. So my question is, do you believe that it was uh, due to cheating in the reality of the first Soviet families who moved on the territory of it's really a question for you as the East Prussia expert. <laughs> um, well, uh, a lot of the Russians, I think you, you would know much more about this than I do, but who moved to Kaliningrad were disappointed by what they found. Would it be fair to say that? After all, the city had been very badly bombed and was in a, in a, in a poor state. Uh, and so how they felt, uh, I, I didn't quite catch all your question. I, uh, yeah. I, I, can I mean, there are many families who relocated in the territory of the French territory and left, yes. left this territory uh, till 2010. Yeah. Because they lived for a long time on this territory, and so it's just my observation that many people, who, the first people who lived there, just now live in Europe. So I'm interested in your opinion whether it was a shifting in mentality. Uh, shifting what? Shifting in mentality of these uh, families. I'm not quite sure about, about that, really. I, I, I wouldn't know enough about but what, yeah, Georg, about what, what, what would you say about that? So, um, actually, so I uh, um, met already in the 1990s a couple of uh, Russian Germans, so those deported from the Volga to Kazakhstan, and there was some who then in the 1990s decided to go to Kaliningrad mm. because this is the closest to the West, and yeah. it was quite clear that for them it was they had not the idea of staying there, but moving this as a first step, then going to Germany. Um, uh, I think so. Kaliningrad is uh, specific, and uh, the 
all we were talking now about, let's say, uh, cultural uh, legacy connections, let's say, uh, connections coming from 19th century societies. All this is lacking as far as I would say in Kaliningrad because you have really this clear um, cut of population. So, uh, and even orienta cultural orientation in Kaliningrad was much more complicated than it was uh, uh, in um, uh, Latvia, or so, Soviet Latvia or Soviet Estonia. But the interesting thing is, when I started going to Kaliningrad in 1992, there was still a lot of Germans al alive who had lived there before the war, and they were coming back on what one might describe as Heimat tourism. And they were welcomed by the Russians. And uh, uh, there was a great deal of c communication between the Russian authorities there and these societies in Germany and I have a great German friend who used to go there every year and who learned Russian and who took groups there and there was the German Russian house there where there were lectures about German literature German culture and there were lectures about Russian literature and Russian culture and the, the, it, it, an extraordinary thing I think was happening that the East and West were coming together there and it, there was great hope and then, of course, that was dashed completely by Putin. It completely stopped all that. And my friend who went there every year, two or three times a year, is now on a list of people who are forbidden to go to Russia. But thank you very much for the question. We've been hoping uh, at the geopolitics, Baltic Geopolitics Programme to do events on Kaliningrad. So mm. don't go away, as it were. <laughs> um, now, we've got a few more minutes left before we move to our reception. We had a question here. Thanks. Uh, my name is Hugh Watts. I'm with the German Department of uh, Longstanding Inclusive of Greece and Russia. Um, and we didn't talk very much uh, about East Russia. And we've also had increasingly the discussions more and more said less and less about Lithuania. So really my question is about the bloc. We've talked about the Baltic states here as a bloc. It seems to me, and I'm a language historian, that um, Lithuania although it's linguistically aligned with Latvia, as it were, we're treating the separate from Latvia Estonia. It's uh, less Hanseatic, perhaps, less Lutheran, perhaps there are many, many other reasons that you'd like to cite. But do we want to subdivide, and if we subdivide, you can say Latvia Estonia, in your response to yeah. the yeah. Is that a block, and Lithuania another, and East Prussia a third? I felt very much when I first went there, the atmosphere of the three capitals, Vilnius, Riga and Tallinn, was completely different. Vilnius, the uh, architecture is um, much more Baroque, it's much more Roman Catholic, much closer, I felt, to Poland. Riga had a very German feel to me. Tallinn feels more Scandinavian, closer perhaps to Sweden or to Finland. And also, I don't think the German-speaking people were so prominent a part of life in Lithuania. There wasn't the, uh, the presence there that there was in the other two countries. Uh, and it, it seemed to me that there was a difference. And the closeness to Poland, uh, the great Polish national poet Adam Hickiewicz, I think in his poem, um, a, a great nationalist poem. There's a line that talks about my Lithuania, and and um, uh, the recent uh, the recent Polish poet who won the Nobel Prize, Czesław Milos, was born in Lithuania, and it, it seemed to me that the, that there was a closeness there that was made it made Lithuania different to the other two. Would you say that was so, Georg, or not? Yeah, so, um, I fully agree. So, um, that we were talking only about uh, Latvia and Estonia was due to the topic Baltic Germans, oh. because we don't have them in Lithuania. Mm. If we would, let's say, talk um, about um, civil society and the Baltic Sea region or whatsoever, then, of course, we would have um, had Lithuania immediately in. And if we talk, let's say, or try to do a comparison, then we should look at the, let's say, Polish-Lithuanian uh, relations. And then we have a similar case with the um, Polish-speaking uh, nobility largely expelled uh, from Lithuania uh, during the Second World War, or after the Second World War. Yeah. Uh, in a similar situation, similar attitude towards uh, the homeland and and of course, uh, similar also conflicts between 
the peasant population and the nobility, uh, the, which somehow lives on. But I the, think where you make a very good point is that the, the Baltics don't like being called the Baltics. They, they don't like being lumped together. They feel that they are three very different, well, not very different, but different countries and should be respected as such. Thank you. Yes, indeed, Sheila's put her finger on that point and also mm. on the, the slightly odd fact that the Germans who lived in Lithuania, say, in the Maimelant, or Kleipet as it's called today, and indeed the Germans in, uh, in Eastern Prussia lived in the Baltic or on the Baltic, yes. but they were not Baltic Germans in the no. sense of, our, of our, uh, our conversation today. And perhaps we should uh, look at them, in fact, on another occasion. Yes. So and of course, the ethnic group yeah. called the Prus, the original Prussians, were absorbed completely mm -hmm. into uh, the new German-speaking entity that came about, whereas the Estonians and the Latvians maintained their... Right. their well, their we're, not, we're not going to have a panel on them. No, no, we <laughs> <laughs> oh, we might. <laughs> but, not, but, not ton but not tonight. Not tonight, no. All right, I'm afraid that's all we have mm -hmm. time for. Um, we, we're going to draw it to a close uh, now. I don't think there are any other questions anyway. Um, uh, but not before doing uh, two things. First of all, to uh, remind you to stay tuned uh, to the uh, Baltic Geopolitics Programme. There will be further events advertised um, uh, uh, and are in the uh, pipeline. Uh, and secondly, of course, to thank our uh, two wonderful panelists for opening up uh, a topic which I think not many people know about, um, but now we know a great deal more. Uh, than we did before. So we're very grateful to you for taking the time and for taking us on this journey. Thank you so much. Thank you.